Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem binary search tree iterator. We're basically implementing a class that represents an iterator over a binary search tree that's supposed to be implemented by in order traversal, basically what you would expect from a binary search tree if you've ever used you know, a real iterator before like in Java or something like that because that's kind of one of the purposes of a binary search tree to have the values in some kind of sorted order. It's not literally sorted, but it's in a way that you could iterate through them in sorted order pretty efficiently. There's really three methods we wanna implement. One is just the constructor, and then two are the actual ones that have some functionality that we need to do. So one is has next. It's gonna return true if there still exists a value in the iterator that we can return. So suppose this input, the iterator is gonna go through all the nodes in, in order. So at first it would do the three, then the seven, then the nine, then the 15, and then the 20, and then it would be done, right? After all five values, the has next should return false because there aren't any values left for us to return. A while there are still values though, then we're gonna return true, but we're not actually returning the value itself with the has next function. The next function though, is the one where we're going to be returning the value. So the kind of trivial solution to this that you might be thinking of, why not just implement in order traversal, run it on the tree, have every single value put inside of an array, and then uh, we can just have maintain like a single pointer, right? Start at the first value, return this, return this, return this, et cetera, et cetera, right? Until we're done with the array and then we're good. Before we implement this solution, let's understand how efficient it would be. Well, overall time complexity is pretty good. O of n, we're just iterating over the entire array, or not the array, the tree. And I guess we can put that in the constructor if we want to. So the constructor will be O of n time, not bad. And then each uh, has next uh, and the next function, each of those can just be done in big O of one time because we're just uh, incrementing a single pointer over this array. Now the memory complexity is also clearly going to be big O of n because we're putting every single node in an array. And if I showed you kind of the bottom uh, part of this problem, they ask us, can we do better? Can we actually implement a solution where the memory is not the size of the tree, but the memory is actually big O of H, where H is the height of the tree? And can we make it so uh, that has next and next don't necessarily have a big O of one time complexity, but they have an average uh, time complexity that's constant. Meaning if we ran the has next and the next function for every single node in the tree, what would have been the average time complexity? It would have to be big O of one. So that's kind of the restriction. So you can see that it's kind of a trade-off. We're getting better memory complexity and slightly worse time complexity because this is no longer big O, this is the average. So how would we go about implementing this a kind of more efficient solution? Well, I'll tell you how, but first let me just tell you a couple problem solving techniques that you can use if you were stuck on this. First of all, this is a tree problem clearly. And usually the solution to tree problems is always gonna be some tree traversal, whether it's you know a DFS or a BFS. And of course, these methods can be uh, implemented, DFS can be implemented recursively and it can also be implemented iteratively. So that's really your options here. You have to try to see which kind of solution will be somewhat effective on this problem. And if none of these are effective, then there might be some kind of special algorithm that might uh, you know, be needed to solve this problem. Probably an algorithm you wouldn't be able to figure out by yourself, to be honest. And in that case, you would need a hint from your interviewer. But the good thing is we don't need a special algorithm. We can do this with a regular in-order traversal but first let's try the recursive traversal and then understand why that's not gonna work. And then I'll show you why the iterative traversal is gonna work. So let's say we're doing it recursively. We start at the root. We try to go left as much as we can because we're trying to do this in order. So, you know, we visit here, then we visit here, and then we keep going left until we reach here, which is null. So then we're gonna pop back up here and then say, okay, this is the return value. So for the next, this is what we would return. But how can we do that if you know, we're two functions deep? Because we did this recursively. We can't just return from the next function. We'd have to pop back to the root, which is okay because let's say we just decide to record these in some kind of list or some kind of array data structure. That would work. 
but at that point, you're kind of doing extra work. While this is probably feasible, what we're noticing is we already have these in memory because we're doing this with recursion and then we're just adding it to a list. We can maybe just skip the recursion anyway and just initially add these values to a list. So instead of even doing this recursively, let's do it iteratively and just start adding the values to a list or rather a stack which is used for iterative DFS. So this does satisfy the overall memory uh, complexity of big O of H because any in-order traversal, whether it's uh, recursive or iterative, is gonna have big O of H memory. But the thing here is, we're not adding every single value to the stack. We're only adding up to the height. And by the way, if you're not familiar with iterative DFS, I actually did a video on it a few days ago, so I recommend checking that out if you're not too familiar with it. But basically, this is how it's gonna work. We're gonna add these two values to our stack. Basically, we're adding as many values as we can. So let's say our stack looks something like this. And then if we called the next function, we would just go ahead and pop the value and then return the three. But what's gonna happen after we pop that three value? Should we do anything different in that case? Because what if we actually had a right child of this three? We know for sure it doesn't have any left children because if we if they did, we would have either popped them already or they would be on the stack right now. So three doesn't have any left children, but it could have some right children. So what we're gonna do after we pop that is check. Does it have a right child? It doesn't in this case. But if it did have a right child, we would take that right child, add it to the stack, and then basically do what we did when we originally started at the seven. From that node, just go as far left as we can, adding each of the nodes to the stack. That's how in order iterative DFS works. In this case, we don't though. By the way, what if we called our has next right now? Would we return true or false? Well, since our stack is non-empty, we know for sure that we do have some nodes left. But is that the only criteria? We'll have to revisit to confirm that we can just check if our stack is non-empty to return true for the has next. We're not 100% sure about that yet, so we'll have to revisit. So now if we call next again, we're just gonna pop seven. And similarly, from seven now, we're gonna go to the right child. In this case, it does have a right child, 15. So we add 15 to the stack, and then we go as far left as we can. So we go to the nine, add nine to the stack. We go to the left child of nine, but it doesn't have one. So then we know we can stop. So notice how we still have a 20 left. It hasn't yet been added to the stack, and it won't be added to the stack until we have popped these values. That is to ensure, first of all, that's just how iterative DFS works in general, but that is also to ensure that we stay within the O of H uh, height of the memory limit. So now literally the only thing we can do is either call has next, which is gonna return true because we know for sure we have some values left on our stack. Uh, and we can also call next a couple times. So we're gonna uh, pop this nine. It doesn't have any uh, right children, so we don't do anything with it. Uh, we can also pop this 15. It does have a right child in this case. So now we're gonna go ahead and add 20 to the stack. And then from 20, we're gonna to try to go as far left as we can, but it doesn't have any left children. So at this point, we've pretty much solved the problem, right? If we're gonna call next again, we're just gonna pop the 20. Then we'd look, does the 20 have any right children? No, it doesn't. So at that point, the stack would be empty and we're pretty much done. So the question we had left was, how are we gonna implement this has next? Can we just check if the stack is non-empty to return true? Yes, we can. Because notice how before we return any of the values, we have to add them to the stack. Even if we just had a node uh, with a single value, we'd have to add it to the stack before we uh, returned it. You know, suppose we had a tree like this, we'd add all of these to the stack and then as we call the next, we'd pop them one by one until the stack is empty and that's how you know that we're done. Now, what if uh, the tree had some more nodes like this? Well, in that case, we do the same thing, pop until we can't pop anymore. But as soon as we popped this one, our stack would become empty. But then as soon as that happened, we would end up adding these uh, values. Well, not both of them. I think we just add this one to the stack. So our stack would still be non-empty. And then we'd pop that and then add this one to the stack. So as long as our stack is non-empty, we still have some nodes that we need to traverse. Okay, so now let's code it up. And so the way I'm gonna call our initializer, our constructor, is basically by initializing the stack. And 
since we're going to have to remember the state of the stack uh, in between next calls, we should make the stack a class variable. It should be a part of the object. And we should also initialize the stack in the constructor because we could be given a non-empty tree as a parameter in the constructor. And if we don't initialize our stack, then if we call has next, it's gonna return false, even though we do have some nodes left. So uh, let's initialize our uh, stack. And we're gonna do it very easily. While the root is not null, we're going to add that node to the stack and then just update the pointer that root is pointing at and just set it to be root.left. Maybe to make this more clear, I could have used like a cur variable. I could have said cur is equal to root and then have updated that cur variable, but I guess it just saves one line of code. So as long as it's not too confusing to you, I think this is fine to do. It's not like we're actually modifying the tree or anything. Now for the has next function, which we know is pretty easy. As long as the stack is non-empty, then we can return true. If it's empty, we can return false. Okay, now for the next function, what uh, node are we gonna return? Well, basically whatever's on the top of the stack. And by the way, they tell us that next is only gonna be called if it's valid. So basically if there still are nodes left, then next is gonna be called. So we know for sure that our stack is non-empty. So we're gonna go ahead and pop from the stack and we're gonna get that node. And when we're returning, we're gonna return the value of that node. But before we do that, we know that there's a little bit of work left for us to do. That node that we pop could have some, uh, could have a right child. So uh, let's uh, get that right child. It could be null though. So let's have a loop while the current pointer is non-null, we're gonna go ahead and add that to our stack, and we're gonna go ahead and update that current pointer to be cur.left. We're gonna keep going left as far as we can, adding each node to the stack. Notice how that's pretty much exactly what we did in the constructor. So if you really want to, you can create like a helper function for these three lines of code so you don't have to you know, rewrite them. I'm not gonna do that though, because I'm pretty lazy. I don't think it's a huge deal if you repeat yourself and it's just three lines of code. So I'm gonna run this as is. Hopefully we implemented it correctly. And as you can see on the left, yes we did, it's very efficient. So I really hope that this was helpful. If it was, please like and subscribe. It really supports the channel a lot. Consider checking out my Patreon where you can further support the channel and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.